Come on, let's lift up our voices. We love you, Lord Jesus. We glorify your name. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this house right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are here to touch us, to instruct us, to build our faith, to enable us to trust you, Lord, for every promise you've made. And Father, I pray today that as we study the word of God, you would help us, Father, to move from places of doubt to places of faith. Father, to move through the questions in our mind to the certainties of your word. And that, Father God, we would act on what we hear today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. We'll turn to three or four people and tell them they look nice today. Somebody might need to hear that. Praise the Lord. Well, you look nice. You always look better when you come to the house of the Lord to worship God. Amen. I just want to appreciate our worship team for all the work they do. Um, such a great blessing. Lead us before the Lord. I also want to take uh, just this moment to appreciate our string quartet this morning. Didn't they do a beautiful job? Yeah, so wonderful. Amen. Well, we want to greet you this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome to Abundant Life, whether you're here in this room or you're watching in Life Chapel, our second venue, or maybe you're watching at home. We've got uh, hundreds and hundreds of people watching all over, not only New York State, but around the country, uh, Detroit, Michigan, Charlotte, North Carolina, Varnville, South Carolina, Powder Springs, Georgia, Florida, numerous places in Florida, McGregor, Texas, Aurora, Colorado, Denver, and other places around the world. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Let's give a big shout out to all of our guests today. God bless you. Amen. And uh, don't forget to worship with us this Wednesday night for our Christmas service. We're going to have a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Well, how many of you brought your Bibles with you today? Are you ready to get into the Word of God this morning? Hold your Bible up and let's begin by thanking and praising God for the gift of His Word. Father, we thank you and praise you today for the Word of God. We declare that it is alive, that it is filled with your truth, that, Father, it has the power to produce faith in us. So, Father, we come before you humbly acknowledging, Lord, our questions and our doubts. But we ask you, Lord, that you would satisfy those questions with the truth of your word, that, Father, faith would rise up within this congregation, that we believe, Father, that the unseen things that you promised belong to us, and that, Father, we would patiently, Lord, move in faith until we inherit those promises. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. and amen. Praise the Lord. We've been teaching here on Sundays about the power of faith, the importance of our faith and what the Bible says our faith does for us. And in Hebrews 11:6 it says without faith it is what impossible to please God. And if you want to please God, you've got to start with faith. And verse 1 tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is looking into a realm that is invisible and is calling into existence those things that are not yet visible. And uh, when you believe that God is and that he's a rewarder, when you seek him diligently, then you enter into the realm of faith and you are pleasing God. And what I want you to know is God uh, has given us faith uh, not as some sort of a bar that we have to reach in order to, uh, to secure something from him, but faith is the life by which we live. It is, the, it is the substance that brings us into the kingdom of God. We're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says four times the righteous, the, the children of God shall live by faith. God designed faith to be a living thing for every believer. And because we have to operate in faith to please God, we have to learn to deal with the enemies of faith and the hindrances of faith that we all face. So today we're going to talk about that. And I want you to open up your Bible, if you would, to the book of Mark chapter 11. We're going to talk about a couple of the enemies or hindrances to faith and uh, look at some strategies to deal with those things. 
Notice in Mark 11, this passage we've read before, but I want you to see it again. Jesus had just spoken to a fig tree that did not provide figs. He cursed it and commanded it to wither up from the roots. Nothing happened uh, visibly in the moment that he said it, but 24 hours later, they were walking by the same tree, and Peter noticed that it had dried up from the roots. And he said, look, Lord, look, Master, the tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus responds in verse 22 by saying, have faith in God. Have faith in God. For truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will come to pass, or literally in the Greek, comes to pass when he says it, he shall have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatever things you desire or ask for when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. Some translations say believe that you received them. But in the Greek, it literally says, believe when you pray that God is answering you, that you are receiving it when you pray, and you will have it later. So faith, as we pointed out, is the exercise of belief now that something we don't see, we will have. Amen? And that's what we need to understand. Faith reaches out and grabs hold of the promises of God and says, I claim it for myself. And when a person is saved or becomes a Christian, it's by faith. We have rituals that we do sometimes associated with coming to Christ or certain certain activities that we do. We may call people to come and pray at an altar. We may, uh, and certainly baptism is an important rite at the initiation of your faith in Christ, but it isn't the water that saves you. It's not the walk to the front of the aisle that saves you. It is your faith that saves you. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So faith is given to you when you hear the gospel and you believe on the message of Jesus and you accept Christ. That means you take Christ and the promise of Christ as payment for your sins and you believe that he died for your sins. When you do that, you're reaching into the invisible realm and pulling the realities of God's promises to yourself. The Bible says when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you are saved. Praise the Lord. But now that you're saved, you're supposed to live by the same faith that you you exercised when you became saved. You're supposed to continue to believe that what God has promised, he's able to perform. And as wonderful as the promise of salvation is, and it's for every person that's here today, God wants every person to know Jesus and to be saved. But as wonderful as that is to come to Christ, now there are all sorts of promises that God has made to us, and we need to believe and use faith to secure those promises for ourselves, whatever they are, whether we're dealing with sin in our life or overcoming our flesh, dealing with an attitude problem that we have, believing God's promise for provision, for direction, believing for God to heal us in some area of our mind or body. Those are promises God has made. Our faith has to reach out and believe that we receive them before we have them. Amen? So you believe you have it before you have it. Now, today, I want to look at this passage again because it identifies two things in particular that are, we could say, enemies of faith or without these things being dealt with, they will be hindrances to your faith. And they're both found in this chapter of Mark 11. Let's look in the 23rd verse. Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Now notice this next phrase, and does not doubt in his heart. Everybody say, does not doubt. That's the first hindrance to faith, is doubt. Jesus said you can't doubt in your heart, but you've got to believe the things that you say will be done or come to pass when you say them. Then you'll have what you say. So we can see that doubt is an enemy to faith. And I want to suggest to you that unbelief is a hindrance to what God can do in your life. 
Look with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew, chapter 13. And let's just see what the Bible says concerning this issue of doubt and unbelief. In Matthew, chapter 13, and we'll pick up in verse 54, Jesus is coming to the town he was raised in, Nazareth. Now, a lot of you have been with me to Israel on one of our tours, and we always go to Nazareth because in Nazareth they have excavated the first century synagogue, the very synagogue that Jesus went and spoke in. And so it's wonderful when you can actually be in the spot, in the place. And uh, it's now a modern uh, city. It's very busy. In that time, it was a much smaller city. And everybody knew everybody else. And everybody knew Joseph and Mary and their family, Jesus and his brothers and sisters. Jesus, Mary went on to have other children. And uh, the family grew up together working in the carpentry shop. And so they were very familiar with the family of Joseph. And they knew Jesus. Now he goes and gets baptized by John and is coming now in the power of the Holy Spirit and he's revealing himself as the Messiah of Israel. And they had heard about all these miracles. And let's take a look at their response in verse 54. And when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, I just want to give this to you. Jesus was teaching them, but he must have been telling them testimonies about the miracles that he had seen in other places as part of his teaching. Well, how would you know that? Because they were listening to his teaching and they were hearing about his mighty works. So Jesus was sharing with them what God had done uh, through him, what he had done in other villages and cities, bringing miracles and healing and deliverance to people. And I want you to notice it says... In verse 55, they said, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? Now notice 57, so they were offended at him. Now at first they just had a question. Where did this come from? But they made a decision to be offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. In other words, I go to these other places. They've never heard of me, but they are open to receive miracles in my ministry. I come to my own house, and there's no honor. There's no appreciation. Sometimes small town people, they see somebody come back, and they think there's something big, and they got to tear them down. It's called the tall poppy syndrome. We don't want anybody to get too big for their britches. It's jealousy. And so uh, they didn't bring faith. Now, verse 58, it says, And he did not do many mighty works there because of what? Their unbelief. I want you to see The Bible says that their unbelief, their choice not to believe his teaching and to believe in him, hindered what God would do for them. Now, there's a partner verse to this. The same passage or the same story is told in the Gospel of Mark, chapter uh, chapter 6. And it renders it this way in Mark 6 and verse 5. Now, he could not do any mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Now you've got to take both passages and connect them together. He didn't do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief, Matthew tells us. But Mark goes on to say he couldn't do any mighty works there. He wanted to. But he couldn't. And this is hard for us to accept. Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal Son, who made everything, and there's nothing he cannot do, when he came to his hometown, he was limited in what he was able to do. In other words, he wanted to do mighty works, but according to Mark, he couldn't do them. Now, folks, we know God can do anything he wants to do, but God has chosen to set in the earth certain principles by which he operates. And he, he is consistent. He's a true 
God. He's consistent with his nature. So he could not make faith the standard by which you receive from him and then supersede the standard that he set. And so this is what's powerful. He couldn't do. He wanted to do more for them. He wanted to do more miracles. And he did what he could. It says, except he laid his hands on a few sickly people and healed them. Folks that were, one, tra- one person re- rendering this said, people who had minor ailments. There's a few folks with headaches, a few folks with back pain. You know, a few, not that those things are not serious and don't need healing, but there were some minor things he could do. But the mighty works, the big miracles, it says he wouldn't do it because of their unbelief in Matthew, but Mark says he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it, and he marveled at their unbelief. That means our faith in some way determines what we receive from God. I'm going to say it again. Our faith, at least in some measure, determines what we receive from God. And if we know that, and if God wants to do more for us, but our unbelief will keep him from doing what he wants to do for us, then the issue isn't God wanting to do more. The issue is us believing. Now, I can't make God do what he said he would do. But I'm confident that he'll be true to his word if I bring what I know to bring to the table. And and if we didn't, now listen, if doubt and unbelief was not an issue, then the Bible shouldn't bring it up. If unbelief wasn't a condition that that hindered the work of Jesus in his own hometown, then it was wrong for Matthew to say that. It was wrong for Mark to say it. And by the way, it'd be wrong for Jesus to say it in Mark 11, 23. Whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt. Jesus said, it's not enough to believe it. It's not enough to say it. You got to deal with doubt. Doubt is a thief. Doubt is a thief that robs you of receiving everything God wants to do for you. And it's a thief because it robs God of the glory he would get if you'd believe. So folks, I'm going to say it again. I wouldn't bring it up if God didn't bring it up. But since he did, I will. And since he's bringing it up and therefore leading me to bring it up, That means you have to think about it. Where are you at right now as it relates to doubt and unbelief? We all struggle with it. And we're going to learn a little bit about it. But Jesus said it's a hindrance to receiving from the Lord. It's a hindrance. Turn to somebody and say, help my unbelief. (laughs) Now notice at the end of Mark 6, it says he marveled because of their unbelief then. This is God's strategy. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Interesting. He wanted to do more. He couldn't because of the unbelief. He did what he could do. He laid his hands on a few sick folks and healed them. And then he went about in their villages in a circuit. He just kept moving around teaching. Now, why would he resolve the problem of their unbelief with teaching. Anybody have any thoughts? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. They needed faith. And the way that you get faith isn't by just praying for it. You've got to feed on the word. The word produces faith. And so he solved the unbelief issue or began to address it by teaching. He couldn't do more because they didn't have faith for more, but he began to teach them because as you teach people the word, faith begins to rise. Hallelujah. So one of the things we're going to have to do if we're going to identify the unbelief in our own lives and the doubt in our own lives is we're going to have to be willing to hear the word and not just having heard it once. Hearing and hearing. We've got to keep the word before us. We've got to meditate in it day and night. We've got to make the word more important to us than uh, binge watching our favorite series, which will not change your life. It will take your time, it won't change your life. It'll entertain your flesh, your mind. 
but it will not give you faith. Now let's take a look in Matthew chapter 17. Not only does unbelief hinder the Lord from doing what he wants to do, but unbelief hinders us in exercising our spiritual authority. Look in Matthew 17. This is the story of Jesus who had just been on the Mount of Transfiguration. He went up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he, uh, for a moment, allowed the Father to clothe him with his full glory, and they saw Jesus in his full majestic divine glory. And, uh, and then after the vision was over, they saw him again in his, in his human form without that glory. It, was, it became manifest for a moment then disappeared again. And they're coming down off that mountain having had an encounter with God, having had an encounter with the glory of God. And how many of you know sometimes when you have a mountaintop experience, when you've just really gotten something from the Lord, you, you have, you've received an answer to prayer, or you were in a, in a service or a worship event where ju- you, just got, you just got touched by the Lord and you feel the presence of God. How many of you know just about the time you're coming off the mountain, the devil's going to meet you at the foot of the mountain? That's just the way he works. As Pascal taught us two weeks ago, Satan comes immediately because of the word. When you hear the word, he's coming to test it. He doesn't want it to get planted in your heart. He wants to shake it out of you. So Jesus comes down the mountain, and it says, uh, let's see, Matthew 17 and uh, verse 14. And when they'd come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. I'm just going to suggest that Jesus was lamenting in this case, not the man per se, but his disciples issue with believing God. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. In verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and he came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast him out? We tried, but we couldn't. So Jesus said to them, well, you know, you, you just, you needed me to do it because I'm the one who has the power. You don't have the power to drive out demons. Is that what he said? No? Well, God loves you anyway. Don't worry about that. Just keep going. Don't, there's no big deal. Just do what you can and, and don't worry, but don't try to assign any fault or problem. It just, you, you did your best. There you go. Good, good, good little boys. Good boy. No, didn't do that. He answered them directly. Why couldn't we do it? Because of your unbelief. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, tiny little mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Does that sound familiar? That sounds like what we read in Mark 11 when Jesus was teaching them later about the fig tree. That wasn't the first time that he taught them about the power of their words, speaking in faith. He taught them here. There's another place where Jesus taught them about the power of their words in the Gospel of Luke and talked about the importance of speaking their faith. But in this case, he's talking about their authority over the enemy, and he's saying that it was because of their unbelief. Because if they had faith as a mustard seed, which speaks, then nothing would be impossible for them. Now, we're just going to pause there for just a moment because Jesus is telling them that even though they were going through the motions and they were using, no doubt, authority and they were using energy, inside Jesus understood that deep down they didn't really believe that it would happen. They didn't really believe. They were trying it. And folks, we, and I, I want to commend them for trying. There's nothing wrong with trying. But the reality is in the deepest place of their heart, they didn't believe that the things that they were saying would happen. And so Jesus has to diagnose the issue. Now, not all Greek manuscripts have the next verse. 
uh, and this is one of those few places in the Bible where we've got different Greek manuscripts. Some of them put this in another place. But in the Textus Receptus Greek, it says, however, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So if we accept that as part of the text, then what was he saying? It was because of their unbelief, however, prayer and fasting. I would suggest to you this, that prayer, which is fellowshipping with God, and fasting, which is pulling away from the world's voices and things, it, can, it usually involves uh, eating less or fasting food, but for the most part, it's a reference to anything that we indulge in that we stop for a moment to get closer to God. It, it, it increases our sense of trust and faith in God because you're with him. Notice the disciples had just been with him on the mountain praying and not eating, and they came down in power, Peter, James, and John. But the rest of the disciples were at the foot of the mountain, and they had not been in fellowship with God. And they were trying to deal with a demonic spirit, and they weren't in a place where their faith was alive and active. And so unbelief took hold. And this tells us something about faith. Faith is not just something you get, and it's always at the same level. Faith can rise, and faith can dim. Because we're living on a, in a world where there's all kinds of circumstances all the time. But when our faith is lower, it's better for us to take a minute, pause, step back, and work on our faith, and build our faith, hearing the word of God, spending time with the Lord, and then engage the demonic spirit or engage this enemy, because we're doing it from a place of knowing who we are in Christ and what we believe. So I don't want to condemn the, um, the uh, disciples too much, other than to say, it's not enough to do something. You need to do it from a place of believing. And you're going to have to deal and be aware of unbelief when it crops up. Now, there's another important truth about unbelief. And that is unbelief often comes in after we start walking by faith. Turn to the 14th chapter of Matthew. Just go back a few chapters. The 14th chapter of Matthew. And we'll pick up in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And when he sent the multitudes away, so while he sent the multitudes away, so he'd been teaching, they had been ministering to the multitudes, he just fed the 5,000, and now he said, you guys get in a boat, go to the other side. Now, Having been to the Sea of Galilee, you need to understand the Sea of Galilee is like roughly, not quite as long, but it's roughly the same volume as Oneida Lake. So it's not this big, massive sea. You can see across it at every point. But, not unlike Oneida Lake, when wind comes, storms come up very suddenly, and that sea can get very, very tumultuous very, very quickly. We've been on the Sea of Galilee before when all of a sudden a storm came up, and, and you can, we were in a boat that was big enough to handle it, but if you're in one of these little fishing boats, uh, it, could, it could top you over. And so they're in the boat going to the other side. In verse 23, and when he sent the multitude away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening to come, had come, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Just tootling along in the water, didn't need a boat. I just love how it just mentions it very, not, you know, not spectacularly, just walking to them on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Sometimes when the Lord starts moving in your life, you can mis mistake it. You can think the devil's doing something, but it's God. And uh, immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I. Notice what he said, don't be afraid. This is important. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Command me, to, I want to do what you're doing. And Jesus said to him, Peter, this is not your territory. This is mine. I'm God. You're a man. You can't walk on water. 
That's my deal. No, he didn't say that. Jesus said, come. And when Peter came down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I just want to say, this is exciting. He said, Lord, I, listen, I, I believe you're doing this. And if it's really you, you tell me to do it because I know that if you say it, it'll happen. Now, Peter was not walking on water. He was walking on the word of Jesus. Jesus said, come. He needed a word. But when Jesus said one word, come, the faith necessary to begin the journey was given. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He needed a word. He said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter said, all right, I got a word. I can walk on this stuff. And he starts walking on the water. He's doing the impossible. Now, verse 29, or verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Well, who wouldn't be? Right? And beginning to sink, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Peter, I'm so proud of you. Good job. I would have liked that. It, yeah, he's the only one that got out of the boat. But notice what he said. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He didn't say he didn't have any faith. He said he had little faith. And this tells us something about people who start out in faith. Little faith takes initial steps towards God, but gets distracted. It says, when he saw the wind... And he saw the waves. When his eyes got off of Jesus and on the circumstances, he became afraid. And this tells us something. Fear is a doorway to doubt. When you, when you look at the circumstances and you look at all the reasons you shouldn't be healed and all the reasons your kids will never return to faith in Christ and all the reasons that you know, your marriage can't be saved and all, you look at all the natural things... Not that they're not real. I'm not saying the wind isn't real and the waves aren't real. But if you look at Jesus, you can walk on top of those things until you receive the miracle. But we start out walking and then fear, what if comes in? What if I fail? What if I fall? What if, what, you know, and he got his eyes off the word of Jesus. He stopped realizing, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And he started looking at all the natural circumstances and the physical realities grabbed his attention. And his mind, this is what I want you to see, his mind got split from his focus on Jesus to focus on circumstances. This is what doubt is. Doubt is when we are focusing on natural circumstances and all the reasons why, and often it's driven by fear. What if I fail? What if what happened before happens again? What if people judge me? What if, what if, what if? And all those things are very real questions for us to ask. But if we're going to walk on the water to Jesus, we're going to have to take all those questions for a minute and put them aside and just say, this is what I'm believing. I'm I'm doing it. I'm walking towards Jesus. Now, Jesus wasn't being mean here when he said, oh, you have little faith. He would say, hey, listen, oh, you, you've got a little faith. Here's the issue. Why did you doubt? And the word doubt here means to waver, to waver. You started out believing, and then you started wavering. And we know when, when he looked at the circumstances, he began to waver. This tells us that doubt enters when we get our focus off the word, and we start looking at the natural circumstances and reasoning in our minds. Now, turn to the book of James, the book of James chapter 1. Is this all right this morning? Jesus said, you can have what you say if you don't doubt in your heart. So we're going to have to deal with doubt because Jesus said that's an issue. It's human to have it, but we're going to have to deal with it. Notice Jesus didn't say, Peter, uh, oh, you had little faith. You had a little faith. But when you started doubting, you should have prayed to me and asked me, to give you more faith. Jesus didn't say that. 
Jesus didn't say, you know, uh, the issue was, you know, I, I, I needed to do something more for you. He was saying to Peter, you started out, you had a little faith, but you wavered, doubted. You began to vacillate. That's the issue, that vacillation. Now let's take a look in James chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach or without discrimination, we could say, and it will be given to him. He's telling us if you need wisdom, you can ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. But notice this, and I'm going to say this to you, out of all the things we could ask for, there's nothing higher than wisdom. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that if you seek wisdom, in her right hand is uh, length of days, and in her left hand are riches and honor. In other words, if you seek wisdom, you get what's in the wisdom's hands. Every other natural thing we could hope to get from God, we get when we walk in the wisdom of God. So that's why wisdom, that's why when God said to Solomon, ask for anything you want, Solomon said, give me a wise and discerning heart. I want wisdom. And the Lord said, you ask properly, I'm going to give that to you. Why? Because when you walk in wisdom, you walk in the necessary parameters that everything else can be given to you. So if you, if you, if you lack anything, especially wisdom, ask of God, and it, it will be given you. Verse 6, here's that condition. But let him ask, what? In faith. That means it's not enough to ask God for something. You need to believe something. Now, if you didn't need to believe anything, he wouldn't tell you to, but he does. You've got to ask in faith. Notice the next three words, with no doubting. This word doubting, diacresis, means to separate between two things. Uh, it sometimes can mean to make a decision between two things. But in this case, it's, it's really also translated to waver between two things, to have two judgments about something. When you ask in faith for wisdom, don't waver. I might get it, I might not get it. I might get it, I might not get it. He loves me, he loves me not. 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 No, he loves me. He gives to me without reproach, and it will be given me. And when that little voice says, he loves me not, you say, shut up in Jesus' name. He loves me. With no wavering. For he who doubts, then they get the same Greek word, wavers, is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Right? It goes back and forth. It's going in this direction, then it goes in that direction. Now, verse 7 is going to tell us when a person is allowing the circumstances of life to get them to waver in their faith, it's going to impact their faith. And it says in verse 7, For let not that man suppose or imagine he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, that seems really harsh. It's not that God's in heaven saying, oh, you doubted, so I'm not going to give it to you. It's that our faith hinders our ability to receive. The Lord's the quarterback. He's passing the ball in the pocket every time exactly where it needs to go. If it's not received, it's not because he had a failure. He wasn't sacked. It's because for whatever reason, you weren't in position to receive it. And sometimes we're not in a position to receive it because while we're running to the place to receive it, we get our eyes on a linebacker or something else and we make other decisions and we waver from what we originally determined. But the Paul goes exactly where he said it would go. Let not that man suppose he shall receive anything from the Lord. Now notice this next statement. He is a double-minded man. Everybody say double-minded. Double-minded man. Unstable in all his ways. Now, the reason God doesn't want you to be double-minded is because double-mindedness produces instability. God wants you to be stable. And the only way you're going to get stable is by not having a double mind. Now, this is the Greek word, di, psychos. Di means two. Psychos can mean, in this case, 
minded or mind. He's basically saying he is a two-minded person. He's got one mind that's believing and one mind that is doubting. And the problem isn't, we all have doubts, the problem isn't that he is feeling doubts, it's not your feelings, it's that his literal mindset, he's got a mindset that says it will not happen, and a mindset that says it will happen. He's got a mindset that believes, and then he's got a mindset that doubts or wavers. So begins to believe, and then when he sees the wind and the waves, the circumstances, he begins to act and talk like it's never going to happen. It, it just, God isn't going to give me wisdom. And the Bible's telling us that when you believe God for something, you need to believe, we saw it in Mark eleven twenty four 24, that you have received it until you have it. Amen. You've got to believe it's come to pass and deal with doubt. It's not that, oh, if I have a doubt, I'm never going to receive from the Lord. We all are going to have doubts because there's circumstances around us. The question is, are we able to deal with this double-mindedness? Can we learn to focus our minds on Christ? And when they, start to, when they start to waver, we have the necessary disciplines to bring them back. And most of the time, why did Peter start to sink? Because he looked at the wind and the waves. They were there. He could even acknowledge they're there, but he was looking at them instead of looking at Jesus. That's the issue. So when your eyes begin to, to move to a different place, it's your responsibility to say, no, no, I'm going to bring them back. This is what the Word says. This is what the promise says. Now, one of the reasons that we have a real hard time standing in faith today is because our minds, are we are bombarding them with messages like no other generation of humans on the face of the earth. We have hundreds of social media friends posting all kinds of things every day to get attention. And you're scrolling through that stuff all the time. YouTube shorts, TikTok shorts, always, every, whatever someone's thinking. And so what happens is you surrender your mind to an algorithm and you no longer are possessing your mind. That's why you can be scrolling and an hour can pass, two hours can pass. And you realize, what am I doing? Well, it's because you've yielded your mind to all these voices and other thoughts. No other generation had to deal with the screen. No other generation had to deal with instant access to every image everywhere in the world at once. Now. But we do. So we're going to have to be especially focused on what we focus on. We're going to need to be aware of what we're looking at. We've got to recognize when we are distracted, moving away, losing traction. To be distracted is to get off your traction. And when you're starting to get double-minded, you have to deal with the doubt. You've got to take a look at that. You've got to deal with it. You've got to focus on it. We're all going to deal with doubts in our head. But we don't want to let those doubts in our mind get into our hearts when we're believing God for something. Amen? Amen? How many of you can see doubt is an issue here? So how do we deal with our doubt? Well, we deal with our doubt by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on the Word of God. How did Jesus deal with unbelief in Nazareth? He went about in their villages teaching in the circuit over and over again, teaching, teaching. You've got to get back to the Word of God. You've got to hear it. How many times have you been in a service and you heard something that was powerful? God was speaking to you and you knew it in the moment. But remember, we saw yesterday that whenever the word, last week or two weeks ago, whenever the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. So the moment you leave service today, there are going to be little birds out there to pluck the seeds out of your mind. Now, telling you that isn't unbelief. It's just a believing what Jesus said. So we have to take those seeds and treasure them and we're going to have to say, listen, I'm, that's why we need to write it down. We need to listen to it over and over again. We need, when something moves us, we need to feed on it until it becomes a part of us. Amen. 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 And you can do this. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I can do this. Amen. You can. You can do it with the help of the Lord. Amen. You can do it with the help of the Lord. He'll help you to deal with doubt. Now, going back to Mark eleven twenty four. 24... Notice, so doubt is one thing, we've got to deal with it, which means we've got to deal with our mind and our focus. 
we're going to, and I'm just going to say this as you go back to Mark, uh, that means we're going to have to, at times, uh, cut things out of our attention span that are distracting us. Now, we're about to move into the month of January of 2024. And uh, I'm seeking the Lord concerning some of these things. But the month of January this year, as a church community, we're going to do a little bit of fasting and a little praying. Amen. And we're going to set some things aside that are distractions to our faith. And we're going to do it not so we can just suffer, but because we'll get clearer without them. Amen. Amen. And you can begin now, between now and the end of the year, asking the Lord, what are some of the things you need to set aside for a season so you can get your mind back? You're double-minded because you've been feeding on all kinds of things. What are the things you need to stop feeding on? Uh, anything that's sinful, you need to stop feeding on, period. But I'm talking about stop feeding on that is maybe just not necessarily sinful, but distracting. It's keeping your focus from building the faith that receives from God. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. He'll show you. Notice again, Mark chapter 11, verse 23. For whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, verse 24, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them or believe that you have received them and you will have them. Verse 23 talks about the power of your words. Verse 24 talks about the power of faith in prayer, talking to God, believing that you receive what you have from God. Now notice verse 25, and, and, everybody say and. And is a conjunction that connects what was just said with what's about to be said. And when you stand praying, now the praying he's talking about is a prayer of faith. Believing that you receive something you've asked from God that he's promised. You're believing you receive it. Now, when you pray, not only do you believe you receive it, but there's another condition here. And when you stand praying, read it out loud, please. Next word. Forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. What's he saying? That when we come to God and ask him for something that we desire, we need to be aware of where we are. And sometimes there's things in our life that we need God to give us forgiveness for. And maybe we've even, we, we've asked the Lord to forgive us. But if you're holding a grudge against someone who sinned against you, it hinders you receiving forgiveness from the Lord. I wouldn't say it, but Jesus said it. Jesus said it. He wants to forgive you, but if you're holding a grudge, you block yourself from receiving the forgiveness that belongs to you in Jesus Christ. It's not that God is standing up in heaven and saying, well, I'm not going to forgive him. No, it's not like that. His forgiveness belongs to us, but if we don't forgive, it hinders us. This is a second hindrance to faith. First is doubt. The second is failing to walk in love. Everybody say, you got to walk in love. Faith and love are partners that work together. And we have to learn to walk in love if our faith is going to work. Now, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, you can write it down. Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that avails anything. In other words, whether you're, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, it doesn't mean you get something more from God in Christ. God gives everyone the same access to his promises, Jew and Gentile alike. So it's not what your ethnicity is, but, end of verse 6, it is faith working through love. Everybody say faith, faith works, works through, love. through love. Which means if you're not loving, your faith won't be working. Now, I came up early on in, uh, in a move of God that was happening in the 70s and 80s called the faith movement. And uh, there's a lot of negative criticism about the faith movement, and some of it deserved, but I want to suggest to you that God was doing something. He was moving people to get back to the promises of God and believe, again, what God's Word had said. 
And, uh, and I, I think that is the most important thing, that we believe the word. Amen? Amen. But I want you to notice that uh, in that in that particular movement of God, some of those people who taught faith were very focused and emphatic on it. You, the, well, maybe what I just read in James. Don't think you're going to get anything from the Lord because you're double minded They would focus on... Uh, sometimes almost a critical spirit of people that weren't believing God. And there wasn't, it wasn't always taught with love. Sometimes people that weren't seeing the revelation of faith were criticized, made fun of, called all kinds of names. And I got, as, as I was exposed to some of these teachers, I, I, I heard wonderful things from the Word of God, but I also in some cases saw some of their behavior. And it wasn't loving in some cases. Because I want you to get this. You can have faith that move mountains. But Paul said, if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Amen. And you know, sometimes we can get bold about the promises of God and what faith says. And we're going to believe God. We're going to stand strong. And that's all good. But there's a commandment that goes along with believe, and that is love. And if you're not willing to love and walk in forgiveness... You're not going to walk in the high places of God, and your faith is not going to profit you. Everybody say, walk by love. Faith works through love. Faith obtains what God has promised, but love is that which enables our faith to work. And when we're not walking in love, we're hindering ourselves from receiving everything that God has for us. And one of the most primary ways that we demonstrate our love is by how we treat other people. And the Bible says it over and over again. We're supposed to forgive those who trespass against us. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Father, forgive me of my sins, even as I forgive those who sin against me. And, you know, I say that prayer nearly every day. And I don't only say, Lord, forgive me my sins, but I always say, and Lord, I just take a minute. And they say, I forgive anyone who's trespassed against me. And if someone comes to my mind that I got judgmental or critical towards, someone that I'm chipped at, I just say, Lord, I forgive them right now. Give me wisdom to know how to deal with that. But Father, I forgive them. I'm not going to carry that grudge. I hand them over to you. Forgiveness is giving someone else's error to God and you choosing to get off the judgment seat and letting God sit in the judgment seat. And there's a lot of believers today who aren't receiving from God by faith because they're not walking in love. And love starts with your own family. You can't berate one another as a husband and wife and pull each other down and constantly criticize each other and call names and let everything that you fear come out of your mouth and expect your faith to work. Now, your, fears may be, your, your feelings may be rooted in real circumstances. I'm not suggesting that you don't have a right to feel angry. I'm not suggesting that someone didn't criticize you or do something to hurt you. They may have very well done that. However, and you may need to hold them accountable on some level, but drawing a boundary for yourself and holding someone accountable for their choices is not the same as being unforgiving. Unforgiving means I'm going to carry the judgment of that person in my heart. I'm going to let that bitterness soak in me. And sometimes we hang on to unforgiveness because we think it keeps us safe. It becomes a defense that we hang on to. But all unforgiveness does is separate you from the love of God, and it dries you out. It turns you off emotionally. It hinders you. Over time, you become bitter. You become distrusting. Everything is ought to get you. That's why God doesn't want your heart to hold grudges. That's why we're supposed to be instantly forgiving people. Now, again, inst forgiveness is not trust. If you hurt me, I'm going to forgive you because the Bible tells me to. I'm going to put you in God's judgment, but I may not trust you right now. We may need to work on some things for that trust to be restored. I can forgive you and still be working on the restoration of trust. Do you hear me? Trust and forgiveness are not the same thing. But if you're going to walk by faith, you can't carry the bitterness. You can't carry the grudges. You've got to let them go. Look over in 1 John. We'll end over here in 1 John. Look over in 1 John. 
Again, we're identifying two hindrances to faith in the Word of God. Unbelief and unforgiveness. Doubt and not walking in love. 1 John chapter 3. Now John is encouraging these believers to walk in confidence before God. He wants them to be confident in their faith and to receive answers to their prayers. You're going to see that in just a moment. And he acknowledges that sometimes in the life of the Christian that we feel condemned. Our hearts, well, he says our hearts condemn us. In other words, our conscience convicts us of things that, aren't, that we've done that are wrong. Now, when that's the case, we need to go to the Lord and get forgiveness of sins, right? And so he's talking about getting confident before the Lord. So let's pick up in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 18. Notice the subject. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Word and tongue only is what he's suggesting. We're acting loving. We're using loving language. But inside, our actions, our internal and external actions don't reflect that love. It's just a facade. We need to really love in how we act and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. How are we going to assure our hearts before him? By walking in love. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So if our heart convicts us, we've done something wrong, God is greater, he knows everything, we go to God, we receive forgiveness. And beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have what? confidence towards God. When you're walking in peace and love with other people, you can be confident before the Lord. You don't have to be insecure because love fulfills the law. When we walk in love, we are doing what God wants us to do. Every sin that we commit, whether it's a sin of the mind or sin of the body, is in one way or another another, a sin of not walking in love. We're not loving our neighbor. We're not loving God. We're not loving ourselves. And so sin is really violating the law of love. And so he's saying, if you've walked outside of love, you need to go to God. He's greater than that, and he'll, he'll forgive you, right? And then once you have gotten forgiven, he said, now you can go to the Lord in confidence. In verse 22, it says, and whatever we ask, we receive. I'm going to say it again. Whatever we ask, we receive. 1 John 3, 22. And whatever we ask, we receive. Receive. What do we receive? Whatever we ask. You mean what I ask, I can receive? What I've asked? Yeah. Now, it's wonderful to pray for something and God responds sometimes and gives us things we didn't ask for. But when we ask, I want him to give me the things I asked him for. Sometimes we emphasize, well, you can ask for this, but God will give you what you need. Well, yeah, sometimes. But you know, I'm supposed to believe that I'm going to receive what I ask him for. John said, whatever we ask, we receive from him. Now notice, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay, so there's the condition. Whatever we ask or receive from him, because we keep his commandments. So I got to keep all the laws of the Old Testament. No, no. Keep reading. And this is his commandment. Here we go. Here's the commandments for the New Testament church. Number one, that we should believe. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We've learned that. I've got to believe. Number two, what's it say? And we believe on the name of the Son, of the Son Jesus Christ, and love one another. As he gave us commandment. He who keeps his commandments, what's that? What are his commandments? Believe in love. Faith in love. Faith in love. Faith in love. Faith in love. He who keeps these commandments abides in him. And he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he's given us. So if we walk in faith and love, we abide in in him. Now, look real quick. Turn over to John chapter 15. John in 
wrote both 1 John and the Gospel of John. And they're hyperlinked to each other. Very often, things that he says in the Gospel of John, he explains in 1 John. So notice, abiding in him, in Christ, and abiding in him means whatever we ask, we receive of him, means that we abide in faith and we abide in love. If I can focus on faith and love, I'm going to abide in Jesus. If I want to abide in Christ, I've got to be believing and loving. Are you in 1 John 15? What does verse 7 say? If you abide in me, what causes us to abide in him? Believing and loving one another. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. I like that last part. I can ask what I desire and it'll be done for me. Doesn't that sound like what we read in the beginning today, Mark eleven twenty four? 24? Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you've received them and you'll have them, right? And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, faith and love. Galatians 5, faith which works by love. 1 John said, if, if we, whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and these are his commandments that we believe and that we love one another. And when we believe and love one another, we're abiding in him. So when Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it'll be done for you. What he's saying is, if we abide in faith and love, we're abiding in Christ. The way that you abide, the word abide is the Greek word meno, which means to live in, to make it your residence, to move in and unpack your bags, literally is what it means. To make something your home. If we make Christ our home, and we let his word make a home in us, we've been learning about how the word gives us faith, then we can ask what we will and it'll be done for us. Remaining in him, we do that by faith and love. So, here's the challenge for you today. We've got to close this up. Our faith works for us. Our faith can move mountains. Even if you have a little faith, like a mustard seed, it'll work. But we need to be aware of doubt, which is that double-mindedness, and when we're finding ourselves wavering, we're ready to get right back to what God's promised, and we need to be aware of unforgiveness and not walking in love. And when we're not walking in love, when we're being mean and grumpy and fighting over the last toy at Macy's or whatever, <laughs> you know, the holidays can be a, a, a test of patience. We're just going to say, you know what? I don't have to be perfect in the external world. I just need to walk in faith and love. The only thing I owe is love. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to let these things go so my faith will work. Amen. Hallelujah. God is identifying these enemies to our faith because he wants us to deal with them and we can do it with his help. Praise the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, I can learn to believe and I can walk in love. So let's stand up together right now and by faith... We're going to walk in love. Now, it takes, it takes love for faith to work, but to really love takes faith. <laughs> Sometimes to forgive someone when you don't feel very forgiving and they haven't, like, you know, come to you and apologized and sent you a bunch of roses or whatever, you still have to forgive if you have anything against anyone. That's the tough part, but you can do it by faith. And I'm going to say, lead us in a little prayer today. And if you'll pray this prayer with me and you'll mean it from your heart, your faith is going to get loose if you have unforgiveness in your heart. We're trying to loosen up your faith so it'll work for you. Amen? Are you ready? Put both hands on your heart and say this out loud. Father, I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins. 
and I've made him my Lord and Savior. I boldly confess, Jesus is my Lord, and I follow him. Now, Father, forgive me for wavering in doubt and unbelief. Forgive me, Father, for getting my eyes on circumstances and forgetting your promise. Help my unbelief, Lord. Teach me to keep my mind focused on your promises in Jesus' name. And Father, I choose by faith to forgive all those who've sinned against me. Just as you said to the people crucifying you, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, I forgive all of them, for they don't know what they're doing. If they really knew, they wouldn't do it. But they're walking in deception or fear or some other fleshy thing. So I give them to you. I get out of the judgment seat and I put you in the judgment seat. You're the only one that can judge perfectly. Deal with them. Change them where they need to be changed. But I release them. All those who've sinned against me. I release them from my judgment and I pray for them. Father, forgive them. Set them free. Now I receive total forgiveness and my faith works because I've forgiven by faith all those who sinned against me. So Father, I expect to see you do what you promised and what I ask I will receive from you. In Jesus' name. My faith works. I'm a believer. When I pray, God hears. Hallelujah. I'm free from offense. I'm free from unforgiveness. I'm free from doubt. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now shout like you believe it's true. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Feels good, doesn't it? Now here's what you got to do. Don't take it back. Don't take back the offense and don't take back the double-mindedness. When your mind starts wandering, say, oh, no, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to stay with what God said. And when people start getting annoyed, say, oh, no, I forgive them. I forgive them. Just bring out those two little letters, F-U. I forgive you every single time. Forgive you. Forgive you. Forgive you. Forgive you. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I forgive you. <laughs> All right. God is good. Let's go and have an incredible week in Jesus. God bless you. You're dismissed. Well, hey, that was an incredible message. Thanks for joining us. That service was awesome. Absolutely love that. Go forgive. Go make sure that you are doing that, integrating the message into your daily life. Hey, Matt, what yeah, you got going on well, okay. here today? Hang on. Before we get to that, that is a wonderful color on you. It is wonderful Show color it to on us. Me. It's almost periwinkle. It is. It is almost periwinkle. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. We have some new merch here in the Wellspring. In the cafe. Wellspring. If you have a chance, stop by the cafe. We have some sweatshirts. Eddie looks mighty fine. That comes in a few colors. We have my personal favorite, the new hoodie with the oh, logo. Yeah. And it's got the peace. Amazing, peace graphic. Yeah. The bird's fine. This is right up my alley. Borderline tattoo art. I'm into this. I love oh, it. This is great. Uh, we also have, hang on, wait. We're just, we're wrapped in it today. Yeah. Light to the world. This was a good one. Light White t-shirts are my jam. Uh, we have them all sizes, all yeah, colors. We, we have kids stuff sizes, for the kids. Yes, we regular do. sizes. Yes, we do. All. Listen, I know your Christmas shopping is not done yet. Ours isn't done yet, and I am praying. I am. I'm finished. You know what? He's bragging over here. 
probably comes before a fall, my friend. I'm just saying. <laughs> Addison's bragging. Listen, if you're like me and you haven't finished your Christmas shopping, stop by the Wallspring Cafe. You know you need it. You know people yep. in your life need it. We don't just have fun merch and style for you to be looking good. We have new study Bibles. We have new devotionals. Val has mm-hmm. a couple new tables of different things set out there for you. That's where you're going to find all the resources you need to fill the stockings and bless those around you. So, as Pastor spoke today, you can build your faith, you can build your belief, and you can possess faith that moves mountains yep. through power in Jesus Christ. Awesome. Well, hey, we love you so much. Make sure you come out Wednesday online in person for our candlelight service. And again, next two Sundays, 10 a.m., one service only, online in person. We'll see you there. We love you. Love you guys.